Excellent. Okay, thank you. This topic is on our Muslims on the true path. Uh, thank Nadia for agreeing to this debate. Uh, there is a thought in uh, society today that, well, truth doesn't really matter. There is no such thing as ultimate truth. Neither I or Nadia believe that, and so this is going to be a very interesting debate. And the topic is, are Muslims on the true path? Now, interestingly, when we read Surah 1156, it says, I put my trust in God, my Lord, and your God. There is not a moving creature, but he gra hath grasp of its forelock. Verily, it is my Lord that is on a straight path. Uh, we must ask the question, why is Allah on the straight path? Where is he going to? And will he ever reach his destination? <clears throat> The uh, basic uh, overview of my presentation is going to be as such. This is a warning for Nadir uh, that he's going to have to reply or respond to these particular points if he wants to have a, uh, a presentation that is relevant. Number one, Muhammad believed his initial encounter was demonic. Now, Nadir believes he trusts in the Sirat al Rasulullah written by Ibn Ashaq, the earliest biography of Muhammad, uh, on Muhammad. Uh, with, whereby Muhammad testifies that he believed that the uh, encounter he had at Hira was uh, one of uh, demonic possession. <clears throat> now we can cross-reference this with Sahih al-Bukhari, volume 9, book 87, number 111, uh, where it speaks of Muhammad thinking that something terrible would happen to him uh, after he ran from the cave. <clears throat> now we also cross-reference this with uh, verse, uh, sorry, Hadith number 115, which says that if anyone has a dream which they do not like, it is from Satan. If they have a dream that they do like, then it is from Allah. Uh, since the commencement of the divine inspiration, according to Hadith number 111, was in the form of righteous dreams, supposedly, uh, then obviously this uh, revelation was from Satan, since Muhammad did not like the dream uh, that he received. That's why he ran to his wife Khadija. <clears throat> the second point that I'm going to make is regarding the night journey, the prayers. Now Muhammad took a night journey to the seven heavens and eventually he came before Allah and Allah told him that he had enjoined upon his people to pray 50 prayers a day. Now if Muhammad were to submit to Allah, since uh, Islam we are told it means submission to Allah, we would expect him to have agreed to what Allah had commanded. Instead he went to Moses and Moses told him, this is too hard for your people, tell Allah to reduce it. Now who did Muhammad listen to? Well he listened to Moses. And so he went back to Allah, told him to reduce the number of prayers wherein uh, Allah reduced the number of prayers and it happened a number of times until it came to five prayers and <clears throat> then he went to Moses again so uh, all these times Allah is telling him how many times his people should pray and all the time Muhammad was submitting to Moses not Allah uh, now the last time Moses uh, told him no even this is too many prayers go back to Allah Muhammad actually felt shameful and too embarrassed to go back to Allah and so just left it at five prayers showing that one of the five pillars of Islam is based upon Muhammad's lack of submission to Allah and his shame and embarrassment uh, I wonder if this is the kind of path that my opponent would consider to be true uh, then we have point number three which is regarding Satan and Muhammad now <clears throat> Muhammad prayed prayer uh, three times for his uh, for Allah's refuge and cursed Satan three times with Allah's full curse. N on none of these three occasions did Allah uh, did Satan retreat. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, Solomon he made the prayer and uh, he supplicated as Muhammad was about to seize Satan, and wherein Satan departed. And we see here that. Uh, according to this pillar of Islam where which is prayer Salat uh, Muhammad's prayers weren't even followed and now it's quite interesting that m uh, Muslims pray the same kind of prayer they pray for refuge in Allah and they pray for refuge from Satan uh, none of these things actually seem to work for Muhammad I wonder how these things could work for Muslims then we come to probably the most interesting part of the debate and this is regarding Surah 3-7 in Surah 3-7 it says that a 
book was given to Muhammad and wherein uh, part of the book is clear and a part of it is ambiguous. Uh, just to uh, close my opening statement, basically the entirety, almost the entirety of the Quran is made uh, to be ambiguous and I wonder how my opponent could trust in such a book. And we'll cover this uh, more in the rounds to follow. Mike is free. Okay, I'll see what I can do to address all those uh, silly things in my, in my brief uh, five minutes here. Um, you know, you're reading Sirah ibn Ishaq, and you said the initial encounter which the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, thought was demonic. Therefore, you assume it was demonic. <laughs> okay, well, the first thing I would ask is, am I, am I debating with a child here? Um, because that's some very silly reasoning there. The question I would pose to the Christians is, have, have you ever like taken religious studies and studied the different religions of the world? You read about many people who claim to be prophets and disciples of Jesus, like Apostle Paul, who is really a man who claimed to be a prophet. There's Guru Nanak, there's Joseph Smith, there's so the list goes on. What was their initial encounter? And compare that with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You see, what we know <laughs> what we know about false prophets is they do not say that their initial encounter was demonic. They don't say that, like the Apostle Paul. He walks and talks just like every other false prophet. So once we have an education on religion, we now know that that initial argument is silly. Okay, because false prophets don't do that. False prophets walk and talk just like the people, of the writers of the Bible. If you look at all the different, if you compare the New Testament and the false prophets who wrote, that, who wrote those books with Ghulam Mirza and with Joseph Smith and all the other false prophets, they say, uh-huh, that's right, I saw God in a vision, and uh-huh, it really is true. They all walk and talk just like that. So this one argument which you are trying to use against Islam backfires against you once we get educated on religion. And so let's go back to Sirah Ibn Ishaq, okay? He did not, and this is a very important point here. But wh when he he raised the question that was his original encounter was demonic, not because he saw something evil, or there was something evil about it. Let me repeat. It was not because <laughs> there was something evil he saw in that initial encounter, but because so nobody, no college professor. The reason why he said that is because no college professor who has taken religious studies can say that that man was credulous. He just believes in anything and everything. He doesn't question what's given to him like the writers of the Bible. And that's why I reject it, because they're credulous. I saw Jesus in a vision and Jesus said to me, you know, Paul, Paul, why do you question that? How do you know that wasn't a demon? You see, he's a credulous person. Guru Nanak, he's a credulous person. They don't bring, uh, they do not question what they, what's given to them. So we can say Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was an intelligent, deciphering person. So this first argument backfires against you. You should never bring that up again. Okay, you said dreams which you do not like come from Satan. There's no hadith like that. Okay? So a good dream is from God and a bad dream is from Satan. Now that's open for interpretation. And so you, the whole thing about lack of submission from God, I'm sorry, I did not even understand. It was more based on your own personal interpretation than scripture. And then you said the Quran in chapter 3 verse 7 mostly is ambiguous. Well, that's your own false interpretation. We read the Quran every day, everybody in my family, we seem to understand virtually everything. Okay? So I don't know where you're going with that, but what's important here is Look how this debate started. I asked him, why don't we question both Islam and Christianity? He refused to do that. He refuses to allow his own beliefs to be questioned. It's very important, but he will question Islam. You see? That's dishonesty. We should compare both religions. Now, I'm going to give you an example of one reason why Islam is from God. Just one of the many reasons. Okay? It all comes back to how you treat 
the enemy women of your enemy, which is a strange topic, but it's a, why it's important is because both Islam and Christianity address this topic. How do you treat the women of your enemy? You will find a lot about this inside both the Bible and the Quran. And look and see what the books say about this topic. And you, and you decide for yourself at the end of this discussion which book has been corrupted by Satan and which is from Almighty God. So, just from your brief introduction, I didn't hear anything that would allow me to question my faith. But what I do understand is in the last couple of seconds I have here is that you can't even defend your own religion. The mic is free. All right. Do I have a clear mic? Do I have a clear mic? All right, thank you very much. Okay, Nadir said that there's no such hadith that says a, uh, a dream that you like is from God and a dream that you don't like is from Satan. Here it is. It's from Sahih Bukhari, Volume 9, Book 87, Number 114. If any of you sees a dream that he likes, then it is from Allah, and he should thank Allah for it and narrate it to others. But if he sees something else, i.e. a dream that he dislikes, then it is from Satan. There you go. From Muhammad's lips himself, this encounter that he had was satanic. I don't even need Ibn Ashaq. Um, so, uh, not only that, but we see that uh, Khadija, it was interesting you talked about women, how, how women are treated. Uh, Muhammad himself said in Bukhari, same Hadith collection, this is in uh, Volume 1, Book 6, Number 301, it's, uh, he affirmed that the uh, witness of a woman uh, is worth half that of a man, and this is due to the deficiency in her of her intelligence. Now, Khadija was not even present at the cave, and yet she gives a testimony. She says, no, 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 this is from Allah. Who should we believe, according to Muhammad's own criteria? Should we believe him, uh, whose testimony is worth double that of Khadija, or should we believe Khadija, who wasn't even there present, and her testimony is worth half that of Muhammad? Uh, furthermore, regarding Surah 3.7, um, it says that a book was given to Muhammad, and in it are verses which are clear, Muhammad. They are the foundation of the book, Umm al-Kitab. Others are mutashabihat, they are ambiguous. And it goes on to say that only Allah knows those mutashabihat verses. Now, according to Ibn Kathir, uh, Imam Bukhari, and Muhammad himself, the Umm al-Kitab is Surah al-Fatiha, the opening chapter of the Qur'an. If that is the case, then you have 113 ambiguous chapters. So how can you understand a book that is ambiguous, at least 99%, more than 99% ambiguous? I wonder how you could uh, even begin to uh, claim to be on the true path when you've got a book that you can't even possibly understand, only Allah can understand. Then we go on to another point, and that is regarding uh, the Quran's mention of the prophets. It says in the Quran in Surah 2, Ayah 285, that a Muslim must believe in all the messengers, and if he does not believe in all the messengers, then they have surely gone astray. Nadir, I wonder if you could tell us whether Isaiah was a prophet of Allah. And I want you to use uh, Islamic sources to actually confirm this. <clears throat> and if you can't, if you don't know, then by default you have gone far astray because you don't even know who the Islamic prophets are. How about Jeremiah? How about Zechariah? How about uh, Amos, Hosea, Habakkuk, Joel? All these prophets, were they true or were they false? I want you to tell us, according to your Islamic sources, whether these were true prophets or false prophets or plagiarizers. If you don't know, then by default you have gone far astray. Finally, Jesus Christ himself said in John chapter 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if you want to come to the true path, you must come to Jesus who claimed to be al haq the truth, and the life, the divine life, in the Greek zoe, you must bend your knee before him. Mike is free. Well, the only problem is now that you're bringing up Christianity, okay, let me address your doctrine. Uh, you must bend your knee before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, the problem is, Royal, you have already been defeated before you even began this discussion when you admitted 
I can't defend Christianity. The arguments we raise against your religion, you can't, uh, you cannot defend. And then you turn around and you're telling me to, <laughs> to bend your knee before that religion that you are dishonestly cannot defend. But you want to question Islam. Uh, yeah, okay, all right. Oh, and uh, by the way, let's go back to the hadith which you quoted. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, thank you for bringing up that hadith. Uh, but see, that's an irrelevant issue because the encounter Muhammad had with, with, with God's angel was real. It wasn't a dream. So you're, it, there's no point even going there, okay? Now, women, remember, uh, the challenge which I pulled, or how you're going to know which is true, Islam or Christianity, it's one of the many ways, by the way, um, is how Islam and Christianity treat women of the enemy. We're not talking about women's rights here, whether women's intelligence is deficient. That's not my challenge. You see, both the books talk about this. Many Christians talk about, well, you know, you should be good to your wife. Yeah, yeah, sure. But what about the women of the enemy? That's an interesting topic. Um, before I go there, let's talk about this ambiguous thing. I already told you, if you read the Quran, it's very clear. You'll be very hard-pressed to find something which is uh, unambiguous. As for what he was saying, that some hadith said something was this, and I honestly did not understand him, and probably because I didn't care. Uh, but anyways, let me, let me move on. About who are the prophets? The prophets are who the, what the Quran says, and the ones which the Quran does not speak about. We don't confirm or deny that. Okay? So in my brief one minute and three seconds, in the book of Isaiah, Jesus Christ, who is your God, ordered women to be raped. Enemy captive of women. Now, let's see what Islam teaches on the same topic. Okay? It, and, and, and some Christians will say, no, 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 you see, that's just a prophecy. That's just a prophecy of what's going on. And at first I believed that, but that's when I read it in context. If you go to chapter 13, verse 4 of that same passage, Jesus is saying, or your God, whoever you believe it is, that I am organizing, I am sending this army to go out and do those deeds which you read inside Isaiah chapter 13, verse 16. Now, I know I didn't quote you the verses. The next time I come up, I'll give you the exact quotations. And so now let's compare that with, with Islam. So Jesus taught to brutally rape women to punish them. Let's see what Islam says about this topic. You're going to find out in two seconds which book is demonic, which is not. Thanks. All right, thank you. I find it amazing that Nadir is denying what his own hadith say. First, he said that there is no such hadith that says a, a dream that anyone likes is from God and a dream that they don't like is from Satan. I provided the hadith, and then he didn't concede that I was correct and he was wrong. Next thing that he made as a mistake is saying that uh, Muhammad did not have dreams. Wrong. It says here in Sahih Bukhari, Volume 9, Book 87, the commencement of the divine inspiration to Allah's apostle was in the form of good, righteous, true dreams in his sleep. And then it gives the actual explanation of that. And it shows when the truth suddenly came and descended upon him. So that is the context, his encounter in Hira. Um, so you have to deal with that. Uh, you said that I need to bend my knee before Allah. Well, I'll take the word Allah to mean uh, God if you want to uh, put it that way. I believe Jesus is God and I do submit to him. <clears throat> Next thing that I want to say is that uh, I mentioned Isaiah and I found it amazing. You actually fell into the trap because you brought up a, a point about Isaiah teaching rape. So I'm going to ask you again, is Isaiah a true prophet or not? Did he teach rape or didn't he? Is he a true prophet or a false prophet? Not that I agree with your argument, but you're trying to make, bring a, something against Isaiah. Now you're saying that you neither confirm nor deny. In other words, you're agnostic about it. If you're agnostic, that means you don't actually have a functioning belief towards that prophet or other prophets that the Quran doesn't mention. In other words, you have gone far astray. You see the problem? Now, <clears throat> there was another point that I didn't uh, actually mention, and I want to, to bring this up because I did mention about Jesus being the, the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, I would like to know, Nadir, since you think you have the real Jesus in Islam, if you could point to me a single group in the, la in the 
first five centuries before Muhammad, before he came along, which group of people were the true Muslims? Can you point to any of their writings? Can you show me their beliefs? And I'm looking for a Jesus that A was not crucified, B was not the Son of God, C was not uh, God manifested in the flesh, D was born of a virgin, and E was a prophet, a messenger of God. I'd like you to provide this for us because according to the Quran, the true uh, followers of Jesus, according to 1933 and 6114, would prevail over and against the disbelievers unto the day of resurrection. Was Allah lying, or was there truly a prevailing group? I look forward to your response. Mike Free. Okay, uh, th that's a good topic to talk about, about the historicity of the first, uh, let's say the first century of Christianity. Because when you look at that, you will have to reject the New Testament like many Bible scholars like Dr. William Lane Craig uh, do. They reject portions of the New Testament as being fraudulent because the historical evidence disproves it. Okay, but that's kind of out of the scope for this to uh, topic. We can't you know, really debate all these issues. So let's put that on the back burner. And again, we can then discuss about how the historical evidence in the first century actually disproves Christianity. Um, now, you wanna, you're asking me about are the prophets like Isaiah and people like that, are they true prophets of Islam? Like I said, we can, if our books do not confirm uh, these prophets, we do not confirm or deny it. Okay, but I'm just showing you, let's make a comparison between Islam and Christianity. Okay, and so I think you pretty much answered your own questions when you said um, that God gave Prophet Muhammad وسلم, good, righteous, true dreams. The, the point here is that the revelation, okay, which, which when Muhammad saw the angel Gabriel, this was not a dream, this was not a bad dream. Okay, <laughs> the bad dream is this debate for you because it was proved you don't want to question Christianity. You just want to question Islam. Okay, and I think right there you were, it, it, my questions at least have already been answered about what is the true nature of Christianity. At least I'm here discussing and debating the, the evidences for my faith. I wish you will one day be able to do the same because if you ever did allow that same questioning for your religion, you will leave Christianity, okay? So anyway, let's go to Isaiah chapter 13, verse 16. It says, the little children will be smashed to death. This is what Christ is saying, who is your God? Uh, right before their eyes, their houses will be looted and their wives, shakab, ravished. When we look at the word, this is the, the Hebrew word, shakab, what it really means is to be laid down with sexually. You can go to my website, examinethetruths.com forward slash rape to see the references which I'm quoting. Now, it looks like God's just prophesizing here these bad things are going to happen. But all of that nonsense has pretty much been answered inside, as I said, in Isaiah chapter 13 verse 4, in which God said that he's the one mustering this army for war. Isaiah chapter 13 verse 3, it says, I have commanded my holy ones. Who are these holy ones? Those rapists in chapter 16. I have summoned my warriors to carry out my wrath, those who rejoice in my triumph. So what is this wrath? This wrath is presented inside Isaiah chapter 13 verse 16 in which all these women will be brutally raped. Thus Jesus used sexual violence against women as a way to punish them. That's what Christianity teaches, okay? And my time is up. And now let's see what Islam teaches on the same topic. All right, I found it amazing that uh, Nadir says he wants to put history on the back burner. Uh, uh, I guess that shouldn't be too surprising since Muslims uh, find history to be going quite against uh, Islam in many more ways than one. Uh, but I'm, I'm still going to press you on that, Nadir, and I'm going to ask you, can you show us a single group with a single piece of writing that confirms the Islamic belief in the Jesus that you believe in? And don't run away from it, because supposedly Jesus was a Muslim. 
Here we should see people who were on the true path, his followers. They said they would prevail unto the day of resurrection. They would prevail over their enemies. Surah 1933, Surah 6114. So show us this prevailing group. Should be pretty easy to find from history, right? Uh, the prevailing ones. <clears throat> Getting back to the Umm al-Khattab. Um, again, you said that uh, you can understand all of the uh, all of the Quran. Well, if you want to call Allah a liar, then that's fine. According to three seven, no one understands its interpretation. This is the ambiguous verses, the mutashabiha verses, except Allah. So, is Allah telling the truth, or are you telling the truth? I wonder which one it is. You could call Allah if, uh, a liar if you want, and just leave Islam. Um, <clears throat> then uh, you say, again, you repeated your assertion that you do not confirm nor deny Isaiah. Yet, repeatedly, you keep trying to uh, you know, speak against his writings. You don't know whether he's a true prophet or not. And since you do not confirm it nor deny it, then you're actually agnostic. That means you lack the belief which the Quran itself commands you to have in these prophets. So I'm going to ask you a third time, do you believe Isaiah was a true prophet of Allah? And how about all the other prophets that I mentioned? Um, then you said that Allah gave Muhammad good and righteous true dreams, and that I actually debunked myself because the Hadith that I read said good and righteous. Well, <laughs> that's what the Hadith says, and makes the claim that they were good and righteous. But again, as I said, if we put that in its context, and we look at what Muhammad actually said, uh, in the Surah al Rasulullah and also in uh, Bukhari volume 9 book 87 number 114 that he didn't like these dreams obviously they were from Satan by the way I wonder why this uh, being didn't know that Muhammad was illiterate um, then you talked about God mustering armies against uh, these enemies and that these people would uh, rape the victims God never commanded anybody to rape any victims. Sure, he might have raised up armies to uh, to fight against other enemies. He never commanded any of them to rape. And I challenge you to show where God commanded these armies to rape. But again, that's not even the topic. Mike is free. Okay, so let's go over some of these points here. Um, the reason why I want to put history on the back burner is not because I I'm running away from it, uh, it's because we don't really have time to talk about that. So I'm asking you not to throw all these different arguments against me. Believe me, I would love to talk about history of the first century, because that history of the first century of Christianity proves Islam. It disproves Christianity, and that's why Dr. William Lane Craig rejects much of the New Testament as a result of the history which contradicts it. Okay, um, and then you wanted to talk about, you know, uh, confirms Islamic beliefs. Boy, I'm forgetting some of the points you brought up. I apologize. I do that in almost every debate. Uh, the verse you quoted about prevail until the day of judgment. Let's put that stuff on the back burner for right now so we can address the, the, uh, the issues we're talking about right now. Um, I never said you could understand all of the Quran. You misquoted me. I said you'll be hard-pressed to find verses which are just completely you cannot understand, okay? Uh, we already talked about the issue about Isaiah, you know. Uh, the reason why I, I'm going against it, it's really, I'm not going against it, okay. What I'm showing you is, let's see what Islam has to say again about it. I've already explained to you what the, what, who are the prophets. We don't confirm or deny anything our scriptures do not confirm, okay. And I want to compare that. Now, you offered a pretty pathetic explanation. You said that, show me in the text where God commanded him to do so. Well, yeah, I'll show you in the text where God caused these women to be raped. That I can do by sending rapists to their doorsteps. Would you like to see that? Here, let me show it to you. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 13, verse 3. I have commanded my holy ones who are rapists. I have summoned my warriors, who are rapists, to carry out my wrath. There's your command right there. Did everyone see that? So Jesus is sending these, commanding these rapists to go to rape these women. You see, if you have half a brain, you will clearly see that as demonic inspiration. I have no, no doubt in my mind that it was a very 
devil himself who surgically implanted this sexual violence into your scriptures. Okay? Now, I'm not going to let you go on this because we can't just attack Christianity and not ask the same question about Islam. Let's see what Islam says about capturing women enemy of war. Now they're laid bare, they're defenseless. What do you do with them? Jesus Christ says, I have commanded my holy warriors to carry out my wrath and that wrath is presented in Isaiah chapter 13 verse 16 in which they murder their children right in front of them and brutally rape them. The mic is free. It's amazing how uh, Nadir keeps wanting to discredit Isaiah and his writings, yet he can still neither confirm nor deny whether Isaiah was a prophet. Uh, it's amazing. So maybe, according to Nadir, all this f alleged rape is actually quite fine with him. Uh, I don't know. It's it's quite amazing to see. <clears throat> um, now, you keep saying that you can neither confirm nor deny. I, I realize that, and by default, you are agnostic towards these prophets. That means you lack the belief in those prophets. That means, according to the Quran, you have gone far astray. This is a problem with you, sir. This is not a problem with me. This is a problem according to your Quran. You say that uh, you don't have the time to cover history, yet you seem to be uh, you seem to have the time to cover something that happened in history uh, regarding these uh, people uh, carrying out God's wrath. By the way, again, God never gave the command to rape. All right, and I still would challenge you to bring that uh, the verse which says where God commanded them to rape. You won't find it. Um, again, according to, listen, according to Muhammad himself, according to Ibn Kathir, and according to Imam Bukhari, the Umm al-Kitab is Surat al-Fatiha, the opening chapter of the Quran, according to Surah 37. That would make the uh, ambiguous verses the Mutashabih verses, all those outside Surat al-Fatiha. That means you've got 113 chapters, sir, that are ambiguous. Now, you can disagree with Allah. You could disagree with Muhammad if you want. You could disagree with Ibn Kathir. You could disagree with Imam Bukhari. <laughs> I don't know why you would remain a Muslim and do so in the process. It says that no one knows its interpretation except Allah. Yet you are claiming to be able to do something that only Allah himself can do. That is shirk, my friend, unforgivable sin. If you were to die at this instant, you would not be forgiven by your own God. Finally, um, just as a little uh, addendum to this matter of your charge against the Bible, uh, according to the Quran, it makes the claim that a source uh, which is from Allah would not have any discrepancy in it. And what that means is that if you're going to say that uh, the Bible is partially the Word of God and partially has been corrupted, then you are disagreeing with the Quran itself because it makes the claim, had it not uh, been from Allah, you would have found discrepancy therein. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. Either the Bible is totally corrupt, according to you, or it's partially corrupt. If it's partially corrupt, then the Quran is wrong. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. But again, you can't discern this because you don't know who the true prophets were. Mike is free. Well, the verse which you're quoting is actually speaking about the Quran itself. So it's, had it not been from God, you would surely find it many discrepancies. Uh, that's speaking about the Quran, not the Bible. But again, that's just a different, again, it's a different topic. Um, whether if Isaiah is a true prophet or not confirmed by the Quran, that's irrelevant. We're seeing what your book teaches and we're going to compare it with Islam. Uh, you said that um, this whole thing about Umm al-Kitab, I think, is so far-fetched. It's your own personal interpretation which we're battling against. Your own personal interpretation says Umm al-Quran is Fatiha and thus Fatiha the whole Quran and therefore anything outside of Surah Fatiha is all Mutashabia. Fine. That's your own personal interpretation. I can't refute it 
because I can't even understand what the heck you're talking about. <laughs> it's so silly. But anyways, if it makes sense to someone listening to this, please explain it to me. But it's just absurd. Okay, so uh, let's get back to Isaiah over here because we got to also compare it with Islam. Uh, you just keep seem you seem to be just keep repeating yourself. It's this conundrum. God didn't give the command to rape. Well, I think I just showed it to you. He is himself saying. I am commanding my holy ones to carry out my wrath. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 3. What is this wrath? Keep reading to verse 16. Their little children will be killed, dashed to pieces, and their women will be raped. This is the wrath of Christ, sexual violence. And who is going to do this? His true born-again spiritual believers. So thus the Christian argument is this. They admit that Jesus is causing these women to be raped because he deliberately sent rapists to their doorsteps. Does everyone see that? That's clear from the text. Jesus is causing these women to be raped by deliberately sending rapists to their doorsteps. So thus the Christian argument is this. I'm going to cause you to be raped by deliberately sending rapists to your doorstep, but I don't want you raped. <laughs> There is no need to respond to such foolish, illogical arguments or refutations. This is actually what my opponent is saying here. Okay, so now we know that the Bible teaches to rape women, and this is part of God's punishment. Let's focus our attention on Islam. Let us go to Sirah Ibn Ishaq, page 515. And now women of the enemy are brought to Prophet Muhammad Now remember, in the Quran, it says you can have sexual relations with women captive of war. But does that mean rape? We're going to find out in just a second over here. But this is very interesting. Somebody is, seems to be copying out of the Bible. This is the exact same situation in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 16. Face-to-face -face confrontation with women of your enemy. Now that the men have been defeated and are captured or have been killed, what do you do with them? We know that Jesus taught to brutally rape them. He also taught to chase them down with a knife wrestle them to the floor and stab them inside 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 3. But my time is up. Let's find out what Muhammad teaches. The mic is free. Because then we're going to find out which book is demonic. All right. Um, let me go to this. So, um, By the way, guys, after this round, would you mind if I take a brief break? It's just because uh, my boy has uh, woken up. In fact, I prefer to do it now if that's okay with people. Um, Nadia, take a little bit of time and um, we can resume this. Is that okay, guys? Okay, thank you. I don't want to <laughs> leave my uh, my wife like that. Okay, I'll uh, I'll be right back. Thank you. Nadir, are you there? Great. Okay, I'll uh, I'll commence now. All right. So it was interesting that Nadir was um, all throughout this debate. He's been focusing on the passage from the Book of Isaiah, yet he doesn't know whether Isaiah was a true prophet or not. Um, yet regardless of whether Isaiah is a true prophet or not, that has no bearing on the debate. In fact, well, I guess it does for him because he doesn't know whether Isaiah is a prophet or not. Therefore, he is by default gone on uh, astray. Now, he said that he doesn't understand. <laughs> he said it makes no... Uh, he says, I can't refute it because I can't understand it. Well, that's your problem, sir, not mine. You should have taken some time to, uh, to actually study this topic. Uh, this is from Surah 37, and I'm going to read it to you. This is what it says. He it is who is sent down to thee the book, i.e. the Quran. In it are verses basic or fundamental of established meaning. They are the foundation of the book in the Arabic Um al-Kitab. Others are allegorical. Uh, but and those in whose heart is perversity follow the part thereof that is allegorical. So my, my opponent uh, is 
one who who pursues the part of the Quran that is allegorical. Uh, if you don't pursue it, then um, I guess you only follow the uh, Surat al fatiha Seeking discord and searching for its hidden meanings, but no one knows its hidden meanings except God and Nadir Ahmed. No. And those who are firmly grounded in knowledge say, we believe in the book, the whole of it is from our Lord, and none will grasp the message except men of understanding. Interestingly enough, Ibn Kathir himself says that Surat al-Fatiha is the Umm al-Kitab. Now, what do we know about the uh, Surat al-Fatiha, the opening chapter? It is a prayer, it is a request to Allah for guidance. O oh Allah, show us the true path. Well, why are you asking Allah to show you the true path? Why do you pray this five times a day if you're already on the true path? So I'm going to ask my opponent, why do you pray this prayer? It's interesting that Muslims pray this prayer five times a day. Re remember, this is as a result of Muhammad's embarrassment and lack of submission to Allah. I did not hear my opponent even touch this with a 10-foot pole. Uh, and so he's praying for guidance. He's praying for the true path, for Allah to show him the true path. So I guess that's the end of the debate. My opponent is not on the true path, unless he doesn't pray Surat al-Fatiha. Maybe he could enlighten us there. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, this is my own personal interpretation. No, like I said, this is Ibn Kathir. This is uh, Muhammad himself and also Imam Bukhari. You can uh, deny these sources, but stop being a Muslim. Um, then regarding uh, Isaiah, I already responded to. This is um, works against you because you don't know whether Isaiah is a true prophet or not. Mike is free. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, the whole thing about the Um Kitab, you know, sometimes I just have to make a decision up here on whether these arguments are really worthy of a response or not, and I've decided it's not worthy of a response. Uh, maybe people can disagree, that's fine. Um, you know, you asked why do we pray for it to show us the true path, the true, pay, uh, true way. Well, you know, royal, because there's many astray and deviant Muslims. You know, you have many Muslims who follow, even as Muslims follow devious paths. Like, you know, and Christians will agree that some Christ that Catholics are not true Christians, because they may be Christian, but they're following a wrong path within Christianity. The whole thing about lack of submission to God again, that just went over my head. I apologize, I didn't even bother to respond to it. Once again, it's one of those things where I just don't think it's ver worthy of response. It's more uh, based upon your own personal twisting of the text. But now, let's get back to the acid test. Because I think this is a good test to find out which book has been, uh, which, who is being deceived by Satan. The reason why, it doesn't matter if I believe Isaiah is a true prophet or not. I'm showing you what your book teaches and comparing that with Islam. Okay, so now let's go to Sirah ibn Ishaq, page 515. And there's actually so many passages on this. Two women of the enemy were brought to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, let's stop right here. Somebody's been copying out of the Bible. <laughs> this is the exact same situation we read in Isaiah chapter 13 verse 16. Face-to-face -face confrontation with women of the enemy. Now remember, these women are being presented to Muhammad because having sexual relations with women enemy captive of war is permissible in Islam. Chapter 4 verse 24. But what, but what if these women don't want to engage in consensual relations? Well, we all know that Jesus Christ taught to brutally rape them. We all know Jesus Christ taught to wrestle them down and stab them to death in the book of First Samuel, chapter 15, verse 3. Sorry I didn't quote that passage for you. I'm running out of time here. So, one of the women, uh, so what the two women brought to Prophet Muhammad, sallam, one of them was Sarah, and then there was another woman. No, not, not Sarah, it was uh, uh, Sophia, I'm sorry, Sophia, and another woman. One of the women began to react hysterically. Okay, because she saw some of the dead, but it's clear that a woman who's, who's hysterical probably doesn't want to engage in sexual relations. Probably it's a fair assumption. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, looked at her and said, get, get, her, oh, get this she-devil away from me. 
threw his cloak around Sophia, the willing participant, and that's when Sophia informed him that she, he was the fulfillment of her dreams, correcting the corruption and the corrupt story of Isaiah chapter 13, verse 16. That's the true path. That's the right way. If a woman doesn't want to have relations with you, walk away from her. Sure, he called her a she-devil, but that's the only thing you can fault him with. That's why I believe Islam is true, and the sa sa Satan has corrupted the Bible in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 16. I think that's my time, by the way. And is that my time? Because it's just three minutes. Okay, good. Uh, and uh, I'll go ahead and give the mic to Royal. Personally, I want to thank both of you for um, your um, recitations. Uh, I, th I know you probably don't look at the text, um, but it was suggested to have five minutes uh, closing arguments. Would you like to do that, Nader? Okay. If I'm not mistaken, you went first. Um, you have to refresh me. Didn't you start the debate? Oh, Royal did? Royal, okay, that's no problem. So, uh, starting now, we're going to give the mic to Royal Sid to do a summation. We're going to time it at five minutes, and then we're going to give the mic to you, Nader, and time it at five minutes. And then we'll just uh, open the room for any kind of discussion. Is that acceptable to the both of you? You could stay or leave or whatever. A dater, is that acceptable to you? Okay. So the time now, um, as soon as Roy Royalson takes the mic, uh, we'll start with five minutes and then five minutes. Your mic will. All right, thank you very much. I do want to thank Nadir Ahmed for agreeing to this debate. I think he did a miserable job, but thank you all the same. I think uh, everyone here has enjoyed the encounter. It was interesting. I brought up the Umm al-Khattab. Nadir said he didn't understand he couldn't refute me because he had no idea what I was talking about. He said I was giving my own private interpretation. I actually gave him Ibn Kathir, Muhammad, and Imam Bukhari. <clears throat> I gave him Jesus and the history of Jesus, and his disciples were promised to prevail until the day of resurrection. What did Nadir do for that? He just said, let's put that on the back burner. I talked about Muhammad not submitting to the will of Allah. What did he do? He said, well, I don't really understand that either, but uh, Royalson is giving his own uh, twisting of the text. Well, how does he even know if he doesn't understand what I'm talking about? <coughs> he hasn't responded to anything. All he's tried to do is shift the, the, uh, the topic away to talk about Isaiah. And remember, he still hasn't been able to tell us whether Isaiah was a true prophet or not. So by default, according to the Quran, he is agnostic towards uh, Isaiah being a prophet or not. Therefore, he has gone far astray from the path. Nadir admitted that he prays five times a day. Why? Because Muslims are, uh, there are deviant Muslims following deviant paths. Right. Uh, and I would say you are a deviant Muslim. And any Muslim is a deviant Muslim because they're on the deviant path. And the whole reason that you have to pray, Allah, show me the true path, is because you are deviant, otherwise you wouldn't need to. Um, very interesting that uh, I brought up the matter of Muhammad praying three times Allah's full curse upon Satan and prayed for Allah's refuge from Satan. That had no effect. Uh, so how does this pillar, which is based upon Muhammad's shame and embarrassment uh, and lack of submission to Allah, how can this be something that uh, Muslims follow, since uh, Muhammad is said to be the, uh, the best example for Muslims to follow? Let's go with rape for a second, since Nadir wanted to make such a big deal of it. Uh, he thinks that Muhammad's name is clear and that his revelation is clear 
from this horrible uh, revelation from Isaiah, uh, whereupon God was judging the enemies of God, bringing wrath upon them, but never actually commanding uh, his people to rape those victims. <clears throat> well, what do we know about Muhammad? He raped someone himself, and that girl is named Aisha, nine years old. I wonder if my opponent would dare, if he had a daughter aged nine, allow a 54-year-old man. <clears throat> and now let's put that in context. Nine times six equals 54. That means Muhammad was six times the age of Aisha, and he raped her. I don't care if you say that Aisha agreed to it. A little girl does not know, she is, does not have the mental capacity to give consent to a 54-year-old man to commit her life to him and to bear children. Now, we know that she wasn't able to bear children. I wonder why that was. Nadir, you wanted to bring up rape. That's your fault, not mine, that I had to bring up Aisha. Now, again, you have given no one in the room any reason to believe that Muslims are on the true path. You have not even come close to presenting any reason why we should consider that Islam is the true path to begin with, uh, let alone that Muhammad himself was on the true path or that Muslims are on the true path. You could not show us uh, Jesus or his followers from history, a prevailing group, we are told by Allah. Uh, supposedly, if this is a promise from Allah that this group would prevail unto the day of resurrection, it should have been very easy for you to find this for us. Um, I'm going to relinquish the rest of my time. I don't need it. Nadir, I think you did a pitiful job, but thank you again for debating. Mike is free. Thanks, Royal, and the same to you, by the way. Um, you know, whenever a Christian is defeated, he will always bring up the marriage of Aisha and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And then he will lie to you, as Royalson did, and said that marriage was rape. He based it on his own personal interpretation, which I just told you, which I've been talking about tonight. He says, little girls do not give consent. Did everybody hear that? But what about big girls? What about when she grew up? Not only, she never said that she was raped. She never said any of these things. Rather, she became his gospel carrier and never said that this was unconsensual. But if you want to go there, then we can also go to Jesus Christ ordering little girls to be fingered in the book of Numbers, chapter 31, verse 8, in which Jesus says... Uh, the, deal, the, the mic slipped, I think. Are you are you there? Please raise your hand. Hello. <laughs> okay, you you want to take the mic back? I'm sure. Yeah. I have stopped the time at about four minutes. Okay, take it back, please. Well, I think it's very important to raise these issues because if you compare the teachings of Islam and Christianity, Islam is superior to the teachings of Christianity. You want to talk about sex with little girls? I didn't raise this topic. You Christians did. And you are so ashamed at what your book teaches. In the book of Numbers, chapter 31, verse 18, grown men are to perform virginity tests upon little girls and I won't get into the details on what that is so when you look at what Islam and Christianity teaches any fool can sit here and criticize Islam but what about comparing that with the Bible if you do so you'll find Islam to be absolutely superior in every way let's he keeps um, going back to this false argument that Jesus never commanded women to be raped he keeps using the word God it's Jesus who's your God. Why are you ashamed to say what your God told these women to do? You see, thus his argument is this. He admits that Jesus deliberately caused women to be raped. Okay, by sending rapists to their doorstep. But he's saying he doesn't want them raped. So, let's see. God wants your... 
uh, deliberately causes these women to be raped, but he doesn't want them raped. That's his argument. No need to respond to such a logical contradiction. It's a terrible contradiction. So, I think the text is clear. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Let's see what he does in the exact same situation. The willing participant who was Safiya, okay, and then there was a woman who was, uh, who was, who was, who became hysterical as Muhammad approached her, okay. He looked at her, and he says, "Get this she devil away from me!" And throw it. Took his cape and threw it over uh, Safiya, and that's when he informed. She informed him that he was a fulfillment of her dreams. That's the true path. That's the right path. That's the winning argument of tonight's debate. Muhammad, or whoever you believe it to be, whether it's Allah or God or whatever, he took a story out of the Bible and made it right. I do accept that it seems as if somebody's copying out of the Bible when you read Islam. Both the Bible and the Quran present women, enemy women, captives of war. It took a story out of the Bible, a rape story, and Islam made it right. No, you don't rape girls like Jesus ordered you to do. You don't force virginity tests upon them. You don't wrestle them to the floor and stab them to death as the book of 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 3 tells you to do. You don't do that. That's the winning argument. That's how I know I'm on the true path. And that's why every Christian apologist from Sam Shimon, David Wood, to all these so-called Christian debaters have ran away from debating me on this issue. And that to me is the biggest evidence. They run away because they know they cannot defend their arguments and they cannot refute this argument. You got a book which teaches to, which justifies horrible rape, virginity tests, which you know what that is now, and wrestling women to the floor and stabbing them. And then you got a book which condemns all this and corrects on this, corrects all of this. That's why Royal Sin cannot quest, cannot entertain questioning of Christianity. He cannot do it. Now I admit I didn't respond to everything he said tonight, but that's just because I'm a bad debater. You know, in debates you cannot really fully give responses to each and every point, and I apologize for doing that. But I think the main issues I did address, and uh, and these wacky interpretations, I kind of put them on the back. I think, and, and there's many evidences like this, but I think the most powerful, compelling argument is enemy women captive war. The mic is free.